Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. So I am delighted to be with you uh, tonight to talk about uh, these Christmas themes. And I've chosen as a topic for tonight what I call the hidden characters. We're familiar with, of course, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the Magi. Those are all the characters that you see in everyone's manger scene, uh, your nativity set underneath the Christmas tree. But I want to talk about uh, this kind of secondary set of characters that I think have a lot to say that are very, very powerful. I'm going to talk first, they're, they're kind of in chronological order. They kind of, uh, I'm going to talk about them as they kind of appear in the gospel. Uh, but I think it's very appropriate that I start with someone that you may or may not know, and that's Zechariah. Now, Zechariah appears in the gospel in the Advent season. Uh, you know, he's, he and Elizabeth are the parents of John the Baptist. Although at the time that I'm talking about them, they don't know that yet. But there's something about Zechariah's story that I found puzzling, mysterious, uh, and yet I think revealed a very, very powerful lesson. So Zechariah is one of the priests of the temple. And that's a very prestigious job. And as such, he is steeped in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, it is his job to really know the Israelite stories backwards and forwards. In fact, it wasn't uncommon in those days for people like Zechariah, believe it or not, this is going to sound very counterintuitive, or you're not going to believe this, but it's actually true that people in those days could have memorized the entire Old Testament. So sometime tonight, pick up a Bible and look at the section of the Old Testament and then page through it and try to start memorizing it. I have a problem with you know, a seven digit phone number, but people like Zechariah could memorize the entire Old Testament. They had it backwards and forwards. They were steeped in it. It was their national family history story. They knew it really well. Zechariah was one of the priests of the temple. There was probably maybe between five and 10,000 priests of the temple. They were divided up into groups and sections. They each had their different uh, duties to perform in the temple. And the most important one was to go inside the temple itself to relight the menorah candles and to, and to light incense. And that was chosen by Lot. Now, because there was between five and 10,000 priests, it was quite likely that never in your entire life as a priest would you ever get to go into the temple. But the gospel begins by saying that Zechariah is chosen. This is a tremendous honor, probably the first time and the only time in his life. He is going to go into the temple, and uh, this is a great honor. However, Zechariah has already faced one of the greatest dishonors, which is that he and Elizabeth in their old age are without children. To be barren in that culture, to be married looking for children and not have some, is a tremendous humiliation. It's almost like uh, turning your back on the promise of Abraham that God gives to Abraham to have a great nation. And so here is Zechariah and Elizabeth, priests. He's a priest of the temple and he has no children. He's already 60, 70 years old. There's no chance. He goes inside the temple. He hears from an angel that he's going to have a child and he doubts. Why would Zechariah doubt? Zechariah was steeped in the stories of the Old Testament. He knew the story of Moses uh, leading the Israelites out of Egypt towards an impassable water barrier. You know, none of the Israelites had seen the movie, The Ten Commandments with Charles Neston. They didn't know that water was gonna part. And yet they're walking out of Egypt towards an impassable water barrier and God makes the waters of the Red Sea part. Zechariah knew that story. He knows the story of Daniel in the lion's den, uh, where the lions don't touch him. He knows the story of uh, the three children in the fiery furnace, where they are thrown in to be martyred, and yet the flames don't touch them. Zechariah knew all these miracle stories about Moses, about Daniel, about the three children, backwards and forwards. Why would Zechariah doubt God's word? Well, the gospel doesn't say. But I suspect it might be something like this. Zechariah deeply believed that God did a miracle for Moses. He did a miracle for Daniel. He did a miracle for the three children. But God wouldn't do a miracle for him. And I think how common, unfortunately, 
that attitude is. We read about all these wonderful events that occur to other people, and yet would God really do a miracle for me? So I'm starting out with this story of the hidden characters with this kind of motto. Don't be Zachariah. Don't think like Zachariah. Don't think that God wouldn't do a miracle for you. If God would do miracles for all these other people in the Old Testament, you must believe that God has profound, miraculous events in store for you. Don't be Zachariah. Believe that Jesus has wonderful things in store for you. We'll move on to another hidden character, and that's uh, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, who comes to Mary. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mary, like all the, Israel, all the Jewish people, are waiting for the Messiah to come. They're waiting for the restoration of the Davidic kingdom. And all of a sudden, Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you are going to be the one who will be the mother of the Messiah. Now, I mean, that is an incredible honor. That is an incredible moment of joy. And the Gabriel, angel Gabriel must have been very happy that he's bringing this wonderful news. Uh, how wonderful that the assignment that he has is to launch the story of salvation. And he comes to Mary and says, you are to be the mother of the Messiah. And at that moment, uh, does Mary say, wonderful, that's excellent, that's wonderful, I can't wait, this is wonderful news. Mary doesn't do that. Instead, Mary turns to the angel and asks a question. A question. That's amazing. At that moment, Mary, Mary really honors every one of you that have ever had a question about your faith. You are in good company because you are in the company with Mary who asks a question of Gabriel. Now, the reason I chose Gabriel here is because of what Gabriel does next. What he doesn't do is say something like this. Mary, how dare you question? This is a message coming to you from God our Father. How dare you question this, uh, this plan of salvation? Who are you, this little human being, to do something like that? Well, Gabriel doesn't do that. Instead, Gabriel recognizes that Mary is a human being and has been given a mind by God. And that mind is rational and reasonable and must understand things. And so Gabriel patiently explains to Mary how this whole process will happen. It's not going to be through Joseph. It's going to be through uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel recognizes that Mary has already made a vow of celibacy. She's already made a vow of virginity to God. So how can she have a child if she how can God be asking her to have a child if she's already made a promise to God to not have a child? And so Gabriel patiently explains. That's a beautiful way of saying that God respects your intelligence and God respects your freedom, that God never imposes himself on people. He never uh, dominates us, uh, you know, like, like people in the Roman Empire would. That God who made us with this rational, reasonable mind, always respects our intelligence, always respects our freedom. Look at all the sacraments that we have. Every sacrament begins by affirming freedom. When we have a baptism, we say, why have you come to the church today? When we have a wedding, we say, have you come here freely and without reservation to give yourselves to each other in marriage? And even when we present communion at the Eucharist at mass, we say, body of Christ, and then we wait for the response. And that person says, amen. So every sacrament that we have affirms that, that initial freedom that Mary expressed and that the Gab angel Gabriel honored at the Annunciation. God respects our freedom. God respects our intelligence. God respects our need to understand. So you are in good company if you find things puzzling, perhaps. You're not quite sure you understand. God expects you to look for the answers. Go to the catechism, go to your parish priest, go to your uh, family, go to friends, uh, so, that, so that every movement, every, every step that you take in our faith is always done with full awareness, uh, full uh, consciousness, and, so that, and full freedom to say yes. So that when Mary says that beautiful yes, let it be done to me according to, my, to your word, it is done with full awareness of what she is doing. She is not swept away by the moment. She is not uh, carried away by emotions. 
it is a full free conscious decision which makes it all the more beautiful so that's uh, we have zachariah and now we have the angel gabriel <clears throat> and the beautiful way that gabriel uh, doesn't chastise Mary, but respects her freedom and intelligence and patiently explains everything to her. So then we have the final one for before we take our break, and that's we return to Zachariah and Elizabeth, but this time to Elizabeth. And this is where Elizabeth is uh, greeted by Mary. So Mary, in the famous story of the visitation, Mary comes to Elizabeth and uh, uh, it's a beautiful moment of family closeness, of family solidarity. Both of these women unexpectedly have children in, in store. They unexpectedly are carrying children. And they are, they are unexpectedly carrying children by the action of God. And so they naturally come to seek each other out and to, uh, to kind of share in solidarity. But here's the beautiful thing. As Mary approaches Elizabeth, Elizabeth announces that the baby within her leapt for joy. Well, that's a really remarkable thing. I think that we could say that this moment is actually the very first ministry of Jesus. This is the very first act of Jesus as the Messiah. You know, he's, you know, he's been conceived into the life of Mary by the Annunciation. And now in approaching Elizabeth, just the, 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 just the physical closeness, the, the, the uh, nearness of Jesus to John the Baptist within the womb of Elizabeth causes that child to leap for joy. So the very first act of Jesus, his ministry, before he's actually born, this is kind of a strange image. So before he is born, he is already ministering and he's, and he's, and he's kind of conveying this sense of joy to John the Baptist. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that from the very beginning, the ministry of Jesus is joy. It is that sense of profound sense of satisfaction, that beautiful sense of joy. Now, this is, this is before he's even born. Uh, I think that everybody should have on their on their medicine cabinet in the bathroom, uh, these two verses that you look at every morning uh, so that this is this governs the rest of your day. And that's John 10, 10, John chapter 10, verse 10, and John chapter 15, verse 11. Both verses start the same way. And they both are quotes from Jesus in which he is saying, I have come so that. So now we have the purpose of why Jesus is born in Bethlehem. I have come in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and life to the full, fullest, not just life, but life to the fullest. And then John 15, 11, I have come that you might have joy and joy that is complete. So the whole purpose of Jesus coming to this planet is not to devastate us because of our sinfulness, is not to conquer us because he's more powerful, is not to dominate us because he's smarter than we are, it's to bring us a sense of joy. We just had this beautiful Sunday, last Sunday of Gaudete Sunday, with the red, the rose colored candle, uh, to kind of remind us of that spirit of joy. That this is, the way that this is the way that you can measure your faith. Is your faith governed by guilt? Is your faith governed by sin? Is your faith governed by a negative image? Or is your faith centered around this idea of joy? That's how you can tell where you are in terms of this presence of our Lord within you. Uh, Pope Benedict used to say all the time that the sign of the presence of Jesus within someone is a deep, profound sense of joy. Now, joy is different from happiness. Happiness depends on external circumstances. Is it raining outside? If it's raining outside, I am not happy. If it's cold outside, I am not happy. I am a Southern Californian. If the temp temperature gets below 60, I call 911. If it gets below 40, I call for helicopter evacuation. I am a hot weather guy. So weather, I like sunshine. I don't like clouds. So happiness comes and go with me in that sense. But the sense that I am loved or that I have people that I do love, 
that provides a stable, enduring sense of satisfaction that is completely independent of weather, completely independent of feelings and emotions. And that's the kind of presence that our Lord has for us, why he came on Bethlehem, why he came to Bethlehem, why he came to Je uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, why he came to Mary, and why he came, came, comes to us, is that sense of joy, that pervading sense of uh, a very, very deep providing sense of joy. Let me just want to say one last thing, one more verse uh, that can help restore, restore the sense of joy. And that's John 8, 34. The truth will set you free. We have to recognize that the COVID-19 crisis is not the only thing going on in the world today. There's your family. There's yourself. There's the people that you love. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on in your life besides COVID-19. And so the truth will set you free that in that first John 8, 34. And if we have a more accurate view of what's going on in our life, it is more likely than we will be able to preserve and protect that sense of joy uh, that God, that is God's will for us. So as we go continue in this season of Advent, we are focused on this birth, this event of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, which is the birth of joy. It really is, I have come that you might have life and life to the fullest. I have come that you might have joy and joy that is complete. And to focus on that and to recognize that uh, COVID-19 is not the only thing going on, going on, that we still have this person of Jesus in our life that we connect to with mass and with prayer. And that is the stable source of joy that is God's will for us. So we've heard from Zechariah, we've heard from Gabriel, we've heard from Elizabeth. I have a few more of the uh, minor hidden characters of, G of, of our story, of our Christmas story to come forth, but we'll take a break right now and... Come to us, O Emmanuel. It's just such a beautiful uh, sentiment. Um, long for for thousands of years because how deeply people want to have that sense of joy in their life. So a few more uh, characters to talk about, uh, and that is the angels, not the angel Gabriel, but all the other angels. And I have this image, this is not actually very biblical maybe, or quite accurate, but I think it, it actually conveys a very powerful message. And I always have this image of Jesus uh, just the moments before he's about to be born in Bethlehem. And he's up in heaven, getting ready to come down to be born in Bethlehem. And all the angels are around him, uh, ministering to him and getting him ready and preparing him and this kind of thing. And, and, and finally, the, um, the chief angel comes over and says uh, the final words and says, Jesus, you're about to be born in Bethlehem. You're about to come down into planet Earth and surrounded by all kinds of human people. So I have just two final words of advice. Don't go. It's a very bad place. It's filled with human beings. They will hurt you. They will probably even crucify you. Yeah. And all of that was true. Yet I can imagine Jesus turning to those angels and saying, nothing will stop me from being with the people I love. Nothing will stop me from being with the people I love. Because I have this mission, in spite of their sinfulness, which has made their lives unhappy. I'm not going there because they're disobedient. I'm not going there because they're breaking laws. I'm going there because they are unhappy. Because sin makes you unhappy. You will be happier if you follow the way of Jesus. If you follow the way of sin, ultimately it makes your life miserable. And so Jesus comes... Uh, really for that purpose of bringing the joy that he wants for us, because he wants us to have that feeling of goodness. And so, uh, and he, but he says, uh, you know, but I recognize that you are living in a very difficult world. When he talks to his disciples and sends them out at the end of his mission, at the end of his ministry, he says, I am sending you as lambs amongst wolves. I know there's wolves out there. There's bad people out there. Sin is still continuing. I have come, I have died and resurrected, uh, but they're still sinful people. But here's the beautiful thing that Jesus says, both at Christmas 
and his final words. So think about that. These are bookend phrases. What Jesus does at Christmas is paralleled by his final words. What Jesus says at Christmas is, I am with you. I'm not going to abandon you. You are surrounded by sinful people here on planet Earth, and I am going to come among you. I will not leave you abandoned. I am with you, and I can show it, I can prove it by coming here to be with you as a person, Jesus Christ. And at the final words, as it says that his ascension is, go into that whole world, baptize everyone in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and know that I am with you. So Jesus, uh, you know, planet Earth is still the way it is. We still have problems. We still have earthquakes and cold weather and poverty and corruption. But Jesus shows solidarity. He says, I am with you. And you know that uh, in any time that you are facing some type of a challenge, we've, we reach out to people around us to, and so that we are not alone. And that sense of solidarity, that sense of uh, community, uh, is extremely powerful and basically enables us uh, to, to make our way through whatever it is that we're, we're trying to face. So certainly in this COVID-19 time, uh, and certainly when this is over, we should still have that sense of solidarity. And that's really what our Lord says at Christmas and his final words, I am with you. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So uh, let me go to another uh, hidden character. And that's this uh, kind of comical character that you see sometimes in school plays about Christmas. And that's the innkeeper, the famous, infamous innkeeper who was so mean and so cruel that he turned uh, the Holy Family away um, uh, on their way into Bethlehem. Now, first of all, we have to recognize that there were actually no inns at that time. There were uh, very large uh, areas for caravans, for large caravans of camels, which are basically the truck lines, uh, truckers of the, of the ancient world. And they would go to large buildings called caravanserais. These were uh, rough places. You know, these are international camel riders going back and forth from country to country. This is not a place where you would bring your family or certainly a pregnant wife. And they were few and far between. But the idea of an inn just didn't exist. What did exist in those days was a profound sense of hospitality. If you were walking uh, in the countryside or walking around in those days and it was getting late and you didn't have a place to stay, you could literally knock on any door of any house and say, I'm traveling through, I'm a visitor, I need a place to stay. And that family would be required by the culture to bring you in. And they had rooms set aside for perhaps non-kosher people uh, that they could be kind of isolated from the rest of the family in that kind of famous uh, ancient Jewish four-room house. And so this would be a place where they could put a, a, a non-kosher uh, uh, person or just someone. So here's Mary and Joseph coming into Bethlehem. And of course, Bethlehem uh, is family. Pretty much almost every single person in Bethlehem most likely was a relative of Mary and Joseph. That's probably quite clear. And so they arrive and there's no room. Now, it's not that there was no, in, there, was, there wasn't an innkeeper, but when they knock on any of these doors or these houses, this really remarkable phrase in the gospel says there was no room for them in the place where visitors lodged, right? Not so much the inn, but in the place where guests would, would reside. So why is that? Well, remember from the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth that the most important thing that a couple could do was to have a child because that child represented that the covenant of Abraham was continuing and that the Jewish people would, would have the next generation. Uh, but the most devastating thing could happen is to have a child of uncertain origin. I mean, if you had your own child, you would expect to pass on whatever your family had to that next generation, but you wanna make sure it's your child. So what we have with Mary and Joseph is we have a child of uncertain origin. Now, Mary and Joseph are in on the vision of the angel. Both Mary and Joseph had a vision of the angel so that they know where this child has come from, but nobody else does, nor would they believe it. And so we have people in Bethlehem related to people in Nazareth who know that Mary has a child of uncertain origin. So look at that phrase. 
There was no place for them in the place where visitors lodged. That's just words on a page, but look at how you can say it. You can simply say it matter of factly, there was no place for them where visitors lodged. Or you could say, there was no place for them in the place where visitors lodged. There was room, we had room, but not for them because they had brought upon themselves the number one worst thing that could happen in the ancient world, and that was shame. It was not poverty. Everybody was poor. We look at the manger scene, we look at the crib scene, we look at the nativity scene, and we, and we often think, gee, Jesus was born under very poor circumstances. How remarkable is that? It wasn't. Everybody was born on the ground. Everybody was born next to animals. Everybody was born in a similar circumstance. When the, when the people read this gospel in the ancient world, it didn't strike them about poverty at all. What struck them was the amazing courage and faith of Mary and Joseph, that they would endure the worst possible shame that you could have in the ancient world. And yet they were obedient to the plan of salvation that they received from the angels. The faith and courage of Mary and Joseph is the story of that innkeeper or the story of the person who wouldn't let them in. That the story of, of faith and courage, no matter what, is profoundly inspiring to the people at that time. Not that they were facing poverty, but that they were facing uh, shame. And yet they would, their faith and courage said, we are gonna go forward uh, no matter what. That's the story of Mary and Joseph that that kind of quote innkeeper reveals for us. So uh, just a few words about uh, Herod. Herod was extremely uh, jealous of any kind of threat to his empire, any kind of threat to his kingdom, any kind of threat that was coming his way. And he would be willing to kill, you know, all the children of Bethlehem in that just incredibly horrible, horrible night of the slaughter of the, of the innocents. And, and yet he is, he is fearful of a God who is the exact opposite, who is non-competitive. Remember, uh, the whole point of coming to planet Earth, you know, is to, uh, to save us from our sins, but not through violence. God doesn't come as a man on a white horse with an army. He doesn't come with a sword. He doesn't come to defeat sinners or to kill them or slay them. How does Jesus come? the most counterintuitive way possible as a little child, as a vulnerable baby. That anytime that you see a child today, and I see it all the time here in the parish when people bring their little babies here, that it, everyone kind of is drawn to them. And um, I was just talking to a lady the other day who's like within days of delivering uh, uh, her firstborn. And I know that when that baby is born, she will be filled with compassion and also filled with courage. She will do anything to protect that child from harm. And she will always come to that child's aid out of compassion and courage. So Herod teaches us the opposite of really the person that he was most afraid of, ironically comes as a person who is counterintuitively the opposite of Herod, a person who is vulnerable, who would die if Mary and Joseph uh, would not care for him. So, and then finally, let me just say something about the Bethlehem star. Ironically, uh, some astronomers, paleo astronomers believe that the Bethlehem star was actually a conjunction, which means that two celestial bodies come together in the sky around the same time to kind of uh, and have a more doubly brighter light. Actually on December 21st, the darkest day of the year, there's gonna be a conjunction of of Jupiter and Saturn in the western sky just above the horizon, uh, they will kind of almost form one light. And a lot of archaeologists think that that was probably the original Bethlehem star was some type of a conjunction of planets that occurred in the, in the sky um, coming from the, the Magi coming from the east uh, would see it in the west over which would appear to be over Bethlehem. But really the idea is that it's something that is guiding you. It is guiding you to our Lord. So any person in your life, any event in your life, I hope even tonight is some type of a Bethlehem star to you that is guiding you closer 
uh, to this person of Jesus. Uh, because more than anything else going forward uh, in this uncertain time with, you know, we hopefully the vaccine will work. We have a new administration. Uh, there may be new challenges going on in your life. What we need is solidarity. We need solidarity with one another, but we need solidarity, especially with our Lord, who the message of Christmas is, I will not leave you abandoned. I will be with you always, even until the end of the world, uh, no matter what, that nothing will stop me from being with the people I love. And that is you. Don't be Zachariah. Believe that Jesus means to be with, be with you in a very remarkable and even perhaps even miraculous way. And in doing so, you are honoring really the, the, the experience, the event of Jesus coming to, coming to Bethlehem. So let us take him at his word. Let us believe what he did. Let us believe what he said, that not only did he come to Bethlehem, but he means to come into your life as well. And especially with the gift of grace that is just exactly what you need going forward. So you were, I've told you about some of the minor characters in the Christmas story, but in the story of you, your life, you are a major character and God means to work miracles in you. Deus Levolt. And God bless. Next, we'll go into the uh, session where we can ask questions of, of Father Dave. And I'm just going to, I've got my chat room open and I'm going to go through them. And Clay Hoffman, uh, Father, Father Dave Clay Hoffman asks, at the time of the birth of Jesus, how well were shepherd or sh shepherds regarded? Were they respected or disrespected by the law and the culture? So they were uh, deeply disrespected. Uh, generally speaking, the shepherds the sh did not own the sheep. They were doing it on behalf of someone else. So they don't have any assets. They were, they were uh, largely uh, despised also because the sheep would very often uh, trespass on other people's property and eat grain and eat the crops and, and kind of do damage to the fields and everything like that. So um, the fact that they worked for someone else, uh, which was always a bad thing, believe it or not, that was, that was not an honorable life in those days to work for money. And uh, that the sheep were damaging people's crops and property. Uh, those things all led uh, people to really very, be very angry at shepherds. They didn't like them. Um, so they were the lowest level of society. So that's why you have this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, remarkable event where you have the lowest and the highest levels coming to Bethlehem. You have the shepherds coming to Bethlehem, and then you have the three magi coming to Bethlehem. People from vastly different social classes, all finding a home, if you will, uh, at Bethlehem. So shepherds were uh, not well-regarded people. Our next question is um, from uh, Ray Murphy. What is the difference between Zachariah questioning Gabriel about how can this be? I am an old man and my wife is along in years. And Mary asking, how will this be since I am a virgin? So those they are both asked one question, but Zachariah was punished. Yeah, that's an excellent question, but I would, I would just say right up front, Zechariah was not punished, but I'll, I'll explain in just a second. The questions seem alike, seem similar at, at first, except that they are different. Zechariah doubted that God could do this, <laughs> that God could make this happen. Mary did not doubt what God could do. Mary questioned why would God go against her own promise? Remember, Mary had made a promise to God to be a celibate, to be a virgin. So why is God now changing his mind? That's kind of what she's saying. Why are you changing your mind? I mean, I've, I've already made you a promise. Do you want me to go back against the promise I made against you? That's a whole different thing. She, she's not doubting the power of God at all. She's questioning this kind of uh, juxtaposition between her promise and what God is saying now. Zechariah actually doubted that God could do it. And that doesn't make sense in light of his 
understanding of all the other miraculous things that God did, Moses at the Red Sea, Daniel in the lion's den, and the children in the fiery furnace. So the doubt that both of them have is opposite, 100 degrees opposite. Zechariah doubts the power of God. Mary is simply questioning God because she doesn't want to go against her own promise. She doesn't want to break her vow that she, uh, that she made to God. So they're very different. The next question uh, comments that they heard that the star may have been Halley's Comet. Absolutely not. Uh, that's, that is, uh, without a doubt, not the case. Um, it, it almost for sure is a planetary conjunction because a Halley's Comet is going to have one trajectory uh, over the, over the, in, the, in the sky, and that's it. But a planetary conjunction actually can go back and forth. And it's, uh, it's a little difficult to describe astronomically, but um, it's called retrograde motion, which, uh, so for instance, if you're on the freeway and you're going 60 miles, 65 miles an hour, and the car uh, next to you is going 60 miles an hour, it's gonna slowly go backwards as far as you're concerned. So as from your viewpoint, it's going five miles backwards, although both cars are going forward. So the car next to you is having retrograde motion. So that's what happens in a planetary conjunction. So that's why you can have this light kind of moving in the sky and seemingly guiding people to on their way to Bethlehem. So the Bethlehem star, you know, the Hebrew word isn't the word star, it's the word light. There was a light in the sky. And so almost for sure that was a planetary conjunction of two planets that were moving by, plant, by a retrograde motion, uh, moving the, uh, over the area of Bethlehem. Definitely not Halley's Comet though. The next question is, would Father Dave please comment on the miracle at the Milky Grotto? Well, there's a tradition that uh, in, the, in the cave, uh, most, almost for sure Jesus was born in a cave uh, because the area was filled with caves. Caves was a very, very common way for people to live because the limestone is very soft and you can kind of carve your own little house out inside a cave. And a cave is warm in winter and cool in the summer. So it's actually quite you know, convenient. Uh, so most likely uh, Mary and Joseph were born in a cave, uh, maybe at the back end of a house. And uh, the legend is, is that uh, Mary spilled some of her breast milk on the ground that mixed with the limestone in there to make kind of a substance of a clay and that people use that for fertility. It's simply a tradition. Uh, it has absolutely zero connection with our Catholic faith. It has no standing whatsoever in terms of our salvation history or you know, kind of what we need for salvation or where to believe. But it is a, it's common um, uh, tradition to, uh, you know, a good hearted tradition to give people who are infertile a sense of hope, right? So that's all it is, is a, a pious tradition that has, um, it's not part of our faith at all. Thank you. The, yeah, the, um, Joe Micatrata, would you repost your question, please? Uh, it's not quite clear what you mean, so I'll get to that next. Uh, Father Dave, um, is there any archaeological evidence for the place where Jesus was born? Yes. Um, ironically, um, it's, it's actually very ironic. There's, there's textual evidence of people who have witnessed this, and that is in the Roman Empire, when they, when they really wanted to show domination uh, against, against some group that they didn't like, they would find out what is your sacred place? What is your most holy place? What is, the, what is the place that is most special to you? And they would do some very careful detective work to make sure they had that right place. And then they would destroy it, slap it down and put their temple, build a Roman temple on top. So they would destroy your really special place and put the Roman temple on top. They did that in Jerusalem over the, over the 
Mount of Calvary and the, and the resurrection tomb. And we have textual evidence that they did it in Bethlehem as well. So uh, ironically, the Roman desire to destroy Bethlehem, to destroy the, the cave, ends up verifying it. So thank you, Rome. Thank you, Rome. Your attempt to destroy it years later ends up verifying it, both in Jerusalem and in Bethlehem. So we can say that the, the grotto or the cave that people visit in Bethlehem, there's very good archeological evidence that that's the cave. There's no way we can say where in the cave Jesus was born, although we have that star that people can kiss. Uh, that's, that's fine, but uh, there's just really no way of knowing where in the cave uh, that the birth would have occurred, but it's very reasonable to, to assume uh, that the cave itself is the place of, of Christmas. Very good. We have time for one more question and we've run through all of our chat questions, but let me add this one. How would the people in Bethlehem have known about Mary's condition in Nazareth? Well, that's a great question. So again, Bethlehem and Nazareth are separated by maybe 70 or 80 miles as the bird, as the crow flies. Uh, but right next to Sepphoris, I'm sorry, right next to Nazareth, just three miles away is the town of Sepphoris, which was the government center at that, at that time. Nazareth may have had 400 people living in it. Sepphoris had about 20,000 and it was the government center. So almost on a daily basis, there would be a large caravan going from Sepphoris to Jerusalem. Nobody traveled alone. Nobody traveled in small groups. Everybody traveled in a caravan of at least 20 to 30, sometimes 50 people. So there was a, there was a steady traffic back and forth between the area of Galilee and Jerusalem. On a daily basis, there was almost like a commuter caravan that you could take. Uh, and so people were interested in family. And so uh, the people in Bethlehem would be inquiring frequently about their family in Nazareth and vice versa. So uh, family was everything in those days, family prosperity, family welfare was everything. So there was probably a very, very strong connection between the family people in Bethlehem and the family in Nazareth all during this time. They would have known everything about Mary and Joseph. Thank you. And the final question, um, uh, Joe Micatrato, uh, I didn't see you repost, but if you'd like to unmute and ask your question to Father directly, we'll see if that works. I would love to. Can you hear me, Father? I can, Joe. Go ahead. Of course, you could hear me even without the microphone, I know. <laughs> Father, I, when, you were talking, when you were talking about the Blessed Mother as a virgin, was she not also betrothed to, jo to Joseph for a future marriage? Yeah, uh, well, but it was, it, you know, it was, it was common in those days for, uh, we think that Joseph was an older man. And Pope Benedict writes about this, that he, that he talks about Joseph as being married before, having children, his wife dies, he's an older man, he's an honorable man, that's the, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. and, and it was common in those days for an older man to take a very younger Jewish wife really is kind of a housekeeper, if you will, or someone to take care of him in his old age. So that would be a way that uh, Mary could be with Joseph, but still protect her vow, still be, still be celibate. Oh, okay. okay, thank you very much. That, that's, that's much clearer, appreciate it. Great. 